Welcome to The Straight Stitch, a podcast about sewing and other fiber arts. This is episode 29, and my name is Janet Zabo. I'll be your guide as we explore all things sewing. The weeks are just flying by. It's hard to believe that we're almost up to episode 30. Except for a couple of weeks at Christmas, I have churned out an episode every single week since about October. I was pretty sure when I started this podcast that I would enjoy doing it, but I hadn't quite expected to have so much fun, so we'll keep going as long as it continues to be fun. I enjoy talking about sewing almost as much as I like sewing. I taught a thread class on Tuesday at our local quilt store. I had six students registered, but one wasn't feeling well and didn't come, and another was a no-show, so I had four students, all ladies with sewing machines, and I thought we had a great time. I am a Wonderfill educator, and Wonderfill put together thread kits for me with sample spools of six different threads, ranging anywhere from 12 weight all the way up to 80 weight, And if you listen to last week's podcast, you'll know that I'm hoping that we'll get away from using the weight system of thread classification. We did a little bit of a field trip while I was teaching. I like to take students out into the stores where I teach. I did this when I was teaching knitting, and I do it now when I'm teaching sewing. We go out into the store and we look at the different threads that are on display and we look at the different needles. And I noticed that on the Mettler display, they have the thread weight listed in text as well as weight. And I think that that's pretty cool. And I hope that we continue to move in the direction of classifying threads using the text system rather than the weight system because I think it is far more accurate. I heard from each student about the threads that they currently like to use. Some of them like to use cotton threads, some of them like to use polyester threads, but I was also very pleased to see that they were fearless about trying new things. So I had them stitch each thread on a five inch by five inch square of plain cotton fabric, so something like Kona. And I suggested ahead of time that they interface the back of the fabric with a lightweight fusible interfacing, something like Pellon's SF101 or a little bit light, even a little bit lighter than that, just something to give the fabric a little bit of body while they stitched on it. And I had one lady who was very methodical. She did a straight stitch and then she did a series of decorative stitches. And she did a different piece of fabric for each different thread. So by the time class was over, she had six different swatches with each different thread stitched out in a variety of different patterns. I also prepared some fusible applique pieces ahead of class and offered those to the students so that they could try doing applique stitches like a blanket stitch or a zigzag on the applique pieces and that worked really well too. So I learned a lot about how to structure the class even though I thought I had structured it pretty well, not knowing going into it. It's always the first time A teacher teaches a class, it's always an unknown because even though most of us have some experience in pacing a class and developing techniques and concepts, it is similar to that old adage that a battle plan never survives first contact with the enemy. It's the same thing. A teaching syllabus never survives first contact with the students, but I'm only going to make minor changes if I teach that class again, and I expect that I probably will. I'm smack in the middle of a couple of weeks of, well, we had Easter, and this weekend we have a fundraising auction for our local fire department. We have the largest geographical area in Montana in terms of a volunteer fire department, 
Our fire department is completely volunteer all the way from the chief down to the lowliest plebe who's just joined the department. No one gets paid. And although we are supported by a tax base, the tax income is not enough to provide the level of service that our department wants to provide. We are currently working toward building a brand new fire station, a desperately needed fire station. And that's what our fundraising efforts are going towards. So my husband, who is the deputy chief for fire operations, is in charge of the equipment sale. We have a big equipment sale on the Sunday weekend of the auction. So he's in charge of the equipment sale. I used to help him with that, but I have retired from the fire department and moved over to helping at our church's food booth. We cook brats and raise money that way. So I'll be there tomorrow and Sunday helping with that. I'm curious to see what gets brought to the auction this year. Uh, there have been years where people have brought vintage sewing machines. We get a lot of Amish people coming down from other parts of Montana to bid on items at our auction. And a lot of times they are the ones who will buy those treadle sewing machines or vintage sewing machines. I certainly don't need any more sewing machines, but I like to go and see what's available. So I haven't started any large projects this week. Mostly what I've been doing is, again, finishing up a few projects, working on a quilt on the Q20. I did make a little zipper pouch because I wanted to try out a pleated zipper pouch pattern, and I'll link that in the show notes. It turned out really cute. I'll try to put a picture on the show notes page too. And today I have been playing with my six inch Creative Grids Curvy Log Cabin Ruler. I got the eight inch Curvy Log Cabin Ruler and the four inch Curvy Log Cabin Ruler, but I hadn't been able to find the six inch Curvy Log Cabin Ruler. I did buy one in February only to get home and discover that I hadn't read the label closely enough and I got the six inch regular log cabin ruler, which is fine. I don't mind having an extra ruler, but I really, really wanted that six inch curvy log cabin ruler. So I ordered it from Shabby Fabrics, which is in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I knew that it wouldn't take very long to get to me. And indeed they shipped it on Tuesday and I had it on Thursday. So this morning I took some time to play around with that ruler. I'm also feeling the need for green for some odd reason, maybe because it's spring. Green is one of my favorite colors anyway, but I really want to make a quilt with green fabric. So I've started a couple of quilt projects and these are not, I'm not hurrying with these. These are just going to be, as I get a chance to work on them, I will work on them. I have plenty of other things to keep me busy too. I certainly don't need any more projects, but I'm trying to scratch that need, need for green itch. And as it happens, a lot of times the topic of my podcast happens to be whatever I'm working on at the moment. So this week we're going to discuss scrappy quilts. I really, really love scrappy quilts. In fact, that's probably why I took up quilting in the first place, because I was so drawn to just the idea of using up little bits and pieces of fabrics to make quilts. So we're going to take a trip back to the beginning of my quilting journey. This was probably somewhere around 2010 or so when I stopped knitting and I stopped publishing Twists and Turns. I wanted to continue doing some kind of textile or fiber practice, but I didn't, I was a bit burned out on knitting and I needed to do something else. My mother had bought my older daughter a quilt kit. I grew up in Ohio, just west of Cleveland, and when I was growing up, we used to go down to Amish country and drive around. And I remember going to an MCC quilt sale, a Mennonite Central Committee quilt sale in Kidron, Ohio, which is where Layman's Hardware is located. If you've ever 
ordered anything from Layman's or been to their store. It's in Kidron. And we were there. We happened to be there on a day when MCC was having a quilt sale. And I just remember seeing hundreds of quilts hanging out for display and for bidding. And I had absolutely no idea that as an adult, several decades later, I would be participating in an MCC relief sale in Ritzville, Washington, where some of the quilts that I had made would be up for sale. But when my children, when my two girls were younger and we used to go visit my mother in Ohio, we would go down to Amish country and my mother bought my older daughter a quilt kit. My older daughter thought at some point that she might like to take up quilting, but she got busy in high school and never took out the quilt. And And after she went off to college, I discovered the kit and I decided to put it together. It was a small wall hanging kit. The entire quilt or the entire wall hanging was made up of half square triangles with three options for layout. I knew very little about quilting at that point. I very carefully cut out all the pieces and sewed the triangles together and put the quilt together. And my friend Margaret, who is 97 years old and was a long member, long, long standing member of our congregation here in Montana, uh, she has since moved to Indiana to be closer to family, but she hand quilted the wall hanging for me and we raffled it off. And at that point I had been bitten by the bug and it was all over. At that point I decided that I needed some guidance. I went to the quilt store in town and I bought a book called The Practical Guide to Patchwork by Elizabeth Hartman. In hindsight that was probably one of the best books I could have bought. It's not a scrappy quilt book per se, but there are 12 projects in the book and it lends, every single project lends itself well to scrappy quilting. There is a rail fence quilt. There's a postage stamp quilt. There is a sawtooth star quilt. I was fascinated by Elizabeth's choice of fabrics for the quilts that she featured in this book. And the subtitle of the book is called, it says, New Basics for the Modern Quilt Maker. And I would say that, yes, the fabrics that she chose had more of a modern feel, but most of the patterns were definitely traditional. The very first actual quilt, quilt-sized quilt that I made was called small plates from that book. I don't remember the fabric line that I used. If I used a fabric line or if I made that one with scraps, I can't entirely remember. I, If I were good like my friend Margaret, she takes a picture of every single quilt she's ever made or worked on and she keeps records. She would make a great museum curator and I'm just not that organized with my quilts. So I don't remember what fabric I used, but I remember that I really enjoyed making that quilt. The next book that I bought is called Sunday Morning Quilts. It's by Amanda Jean Nyberg and Cheryl Arkison. And Amanda Jean Nyberg had a blog for a long time called Crazy Mom Quilts. She ended the blog in 2018 so that she could go on to some other projects. But I used to love reading her blog and reading about her projects. Cheryl Arkison, I believe, is still quilting, um, although her aesthetic tends a little bit more modern than I like, so I don't follow her as much as I used to follow Amanda Jean. But Sunday Morning Quilts is probably the one book that if I had to be stranded on a desert island with only one quilting book, it would be that one. There are three patterns in that book that I have made multiple times. The first one is called Scrapper's Delight, and that is a log cabin style block where a true log cabin quilt would have logs added to each side. This one has logs added only to two sides, 
and you make a 12 and a half inch square and then you put four of those squares together so that the center squares all meet. There are other layouts that you can do certainly, but that's the one that's in the book. The first version that I made of that quilt was a bright, riotous, multicolored, queen-sized quilt for our bed. I used scraps of my own, and I used scraps that a friend of mine from the East Coast named Kate sent to me, and every time I looked at the scraps in that quilt, I was reminded of Kate. But that quilt ended up being a little bit too small for our bed. We have a queen size bed, but I like to have a longer drop on either side. So I remade it and I made it in bright riotous colors again because that's that's my jam. But I made a king size quilt. I think it was a 108 by 108 when it was all said and done. I've also made it in low volume prints, so cream colors, cream and white and gray. And I also did a king size quilt with that one. I'm going to try to put that one on our bed for the summer, but it's going to have to come with explicit instructions for my husband not to sit on it because I don't want it to get dirty, but it looks so nice when it's on the bed that I'd like to have it on there at least for a couple months out of the year. The second pattern that I've made from that book is called Candy Coated. And I have made so many of this pattern that I can't remember how, exactly how many. It's upwards of 10 or 12 versions. I like it because it doesn't, all of the patterns in this book are like this. They don't really require a lot of measuring. And this is probably as close to improv quilting as I'm going to get. I have made multicolor versions. I have made monochromatic versions. Uh, it's just a great way to use up scraps because I seem to have a lot of strings or strips. So I save strips anywhere from maybe an inch and a half up to three inches. And all you do is sew your strips together and trim them to a particular size and a particular length of row and then sew your rows together and boom, you have a quilt. I like this pattern so much that I have been known to take actual yardage or fat quarters and cut them up so that I can make a candy coated quilt. I've also made the quilt for which the book is named. The quilt is called Sunday Morning and it's a low volume quilt and I did do a low volume version. It turned out beautifully. It was a lot of pinks and purples with a little bit of a creamsicle orange thrown in and oh my goodness did that liven up the quilt. And in terms of theory rather than actual patterns, I absolutely love Roberta Horton's book called Scrap Quilts, The Art of Making Do. Unfortunately, Roberta Horton is no longer with us, but she had an absolute mastery of color and composition and even her scrap quilts are amazing. So what is it about scrap quilts? I've asked myself this question quite a few times. I will go to a quilt show and admire perfectly matched and pieced quilts that have lovely curated fabrics in them and impeccable quilting and they are absolute works of art, but it's the scrap quilts that speak to my soul. I am fascinated by how two fabrics placed next to each other interact. Each of those fabrics might play well together with other fabrics, but next to each other they fight. So what is it that makes a fabric want to be next to one fabric and not next to another one? I just find this endlessly fascinating. I love to play with texture, so finding those quilt fabrics that have movement or texture or some indefinable little spark that brings the whole quilt together. It seems like a puzzle to me and I can't resist. What are the secrets to creating a great scrap quilt? I don't claim to be an expert, but I'll tell you what I like to do and how I like to approach this. I usually save all of my scraps and I sort them by color. <laughs> 
And for me, a scrap is anything that's a bit smaller than a fat quarter. If it's a fat quarter, I'll use it in a fat quarter type quilt, but if it's less than a fat quarter or if it's a strip of fabric that perhaps is with the fabric but only six or eight inches wide, then it goes into my scrap pile. And I sort those scraps by color and then I take the largest ones and I'll start by cutting them into five inch squares. I have an AccuQuilt Studio cutter with the five inch die so I can layer up to 10 layers of quilting cotton on the die which has eight squares. So one pass will give me 80 squares of fabric. I don't necessarily use a lot of five inch squares in my quilts. I tend to gravitate more toward strings, but every year or two our congregation makes comforters for Mennonite Central Committee. And one of the quickest ways to make comforters is to sew together five inch squares to make a 60 by 80 inch comforter. I keep a bin of five inch squares in both solids and prints. And we have a lady in our congregation who will take my bin of squares and sew them into comforter tops. She's got a pattern that she uses where she sorts by color and makes diagonal lines with the five inch squares. We layer those with batting and backing and then have a comforter tying party at our church. So we had one at the end of February. I couldn't go because I was on my way to Sew Expo to teach in Seattle, but about a dozen people from our congregation got together and tied the comforters with cotton thread. And we finished six comforters, which will be donated to MCC. And I'm sure that next year we'll probably do it again. So that's where most of my five inch squares go. Once I'm done with the five inch squares, I will move on to making strips. And again, I have the strip cutters for my AccuQuilt cutter. So I can make strips anywhere from an inch and a half wide up to three inches wide. And depending on what, what I need at that particular moment, I'll cut up fabric into strips and that gets sorted into large bags like grocery bags with handles or bags that you might get if you bought a lot of items at a department store. Sometimes they give you those paper bags with handles. I keep those and all of my strings go into those bags. When one of those bags is overflowing, that's usually when I start either a candy coated or a scrapper's delight quilt from the Sunday morning quilts book. And those are quilts that I can work on as I have time. They don't require a lot of measuring. It's just sewing and trimming, sewing and trimming, sewing and trimming. Scrap quilts can be glorious free-for-alls, but if you have a little bit of color theory under your belt, you can rein it in a little and impose some structure on your scrap quilts. You can make a monochromatic scrap quilt. So sometimes I will do, I tend to have a lot of scraps in cream and white and also in red. Those are my two largest uh, string bags right now. So I might do all red and pink and orange and purple, or I might do all cream and gray and beige. I try to keep my colors all in the same family or monochromatic. You heard me say toward the beginning of the podcast that I'm craving green right now. So I'm delving into my green bag of green strings and I'll talk about that quilt specifically in a minute. I've got one scrap quilt that has been a leader in Ender Project and it may end up being more than one quilt because I just have so many two and a half inch squares. When I was in high school, I took an art class and our art, our art teacher's name was Miss Fury and she was wonderful. Sadly, she is no longer with us either, but she had us do in our freshman art class a project that she called 88 squares. We had to take a large sheet of paper and grid it off into 88 
one inch or one and a half inch squares. I don't remember exactly how big they were. And then we had to choose two opposing colors on the color wheel. So we could do purple and yellow, we could do orange and blue, we could do red and green. I chose orange and blue. And then we had to fill every single square with a unique design. It had to be some kind of geometric design and it had to be drawn in and then filled in with tempera paint. And the paints had to be, they could be used in their pure form, but they could also be tinted with white or black to create variations on the original colors. I don't know what happened to mine. I wish I still had it. I think my sister still has hers, but I wanted to do a quilt that was along those lines. So I've got a large box of two and a half inch squares in turquoises and oranges and all shades of turquoise and orange. And I'm putting together an 88 squares quilt in memory of Miss Fury. No matter how you choose your scraps, I like to adhere to a principle that I first heard Mary Fawns talk about. And she's the daughter of Mary Ann Fawns. And if you have been quilting for any length of time, you might know of the PBS show Fonz and Porter's love of quilting. Mary Ann Fonz and Liz Porter had a long-running PBS show where they did all things quilting. Mary Ann's daughter, Mary Fonz, also hosted some of those shows. She is a quilting designer in her own right. And she talks about, this is in her book, Make Plus Love Quilts. She talks about the concept of a rogue block where everything is nicely laid out and organized and then all of a sudden you happen upon a block that might be made up of different colors or turned the wrong way or it's just something that interrupts the flow of the whole but it pulls everything together and I think not only can you have a rogue block but you could have a rogue fabric so when you've chosen all of your fabrics for your quilt think about what you could throw in there that might liven it up a little bit. You're making a pink and purple quilt, but could you toss a little bit of creamsicle orange in there and see what happens? Or maybe even a bright orange. Another way to keep your quilt looking a little bit more planned and less like you threw every fabric you could find at it is to have some kind of a unifying fabric. This could be the background. It could be a particular fabric that appears in every single block. No matter what the other fabrics in that block are, that one fabric will appear in every single block. You could choose a theme. For instance, you could do all 1930s reproduction fabrics, or you could do all children's fabrics. And from that point, anything goes. Scrappy doesn't have to look like a an accident. Maybe every block in a quilt is scrappy, but the entire quilt is tied together by a uniform kind of sashing or border. I actually like to throw caution to the wind and do a completely scrappy background as well as scrappy blocks. So the curvy log cabin that I'm doing right now, I'm doing the round part. So in a curvy log cabin, what you do is you make each quadrant of a circle. I'm using the six inch ruler, so each quadrant is going to be six inches. And when you put those four quadrants together, you can form a scrappy log cabin circle of one color with a background of a different color. That's not the only layout, but that's the layout that I'm probably going to use in whatever quilt I make. So in my quadrants, the green was the circle and the cream or white was the background. And I briefly considered using all of the same color for the background. So something like Kona white or Kona snow. But then I decided what the heck, I'm just going to make it all totally scrappy and 
I'm using scrappy green and scrappy background, so the backgrounds are all kind of whites and creams. Some people like to be completely random when they're doing quilts like this. In Sunday morning quilts, I think one of the pieces of advice that's given is to uh, put all of your scraps into a bag and just pull them out without looking. If you're one of those people that agonizes over what fabric looks good next to what fabric, that might be a way to kind of jump into the deep end of the pool and just go completely scrappy. I've done that. I tend to, even though I don't agonize over what fabric goes next to what fabric, I do try to shake things up a little bit. So if I have a lime green fabric, I might put a dark green fabric next to it. If I have a really busy print, I might put something a little more sedate next to it just to give my eyes a place to rest so that it's not completely riotous. I firmly believe that in designing, the the quilt will tell you what it wants. And if you listen, if you become accustomed to considering what the quilt wants, it will tell you. It will tell you that it's time for, it's time for that lime green or it's time for that pale olive. It'll tell you that you need to toss a little bit of orange into the pink and purple quilt. That's something that comes with practice, but you also shouldn't be afraid of your own intuition. Do you have any tips for scrappy quilts? Do you like to make scrappy quilts? Maybe you don't. Maybe you prefer a different style of quilt. Maybe you have friends who like to make scrappy quilts who will take all of your scraps off your hands. And if so, I consider you very fortunate. I'd love to hear how you feel about scrappy quilts and whether or not they have a place in your life. Perhaps you have a favorite scrappy quilt pattern that you like to use. Leave it in the comments or let me know via email and I'll share that in a future episode. Speaking of our future episodes, I've got a string of interviews coming up. You may get a break from listening to me talk for a while. I've got about half a dozen very interesting people lined up to talk to, and I expect to be sharing those interviews in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. As always, I will end by letting you know that the show notes will be on the podcast website at www.thestraightstitchpodcast.com. You can email me at janet at janetzabo.com. My website is www.janetzabo.com, and I have links there to my blog where I talk about life in Montana and also links to my knitting website, Big Sky Knitting Designs. I'd love it if you left a rating or a review at iTunes. That helps other people find the podcast. And until our next episode, I hope that you have a great week and that you get to go sew something.